Maybe not. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Block Space Exposition, where the first question is, does my clicker work? The slide should be on the, test, test. On the screen. Testing, testing. Test, test. Aha. Oh, this is a little too far into the slides. Ooh. Yeah, where? Cool. All right. You there, talking. If you came to a blockchain conference, you might be interested in the one product which blockchains offer, Blockspace. And we have got a pretty good set of representatives, you know, almost like a supply slide collusion network of Blockspace up here on the panel. We've got Ethereum, we've got Gnosis, we've got Cosmos, we've got Polkadot. And they are here to sell you some Blockspace, even if you didn't think you needed it. So um, we will start our exposition off this afternoon. Uh, with some brief overview presentations from each of these block space street salesmen on the state of their block space and how they think about it and why you might be interested. Um, and then we will dive into a bit of a panel debate, trying to answer the questions of block space supply and demand. What are they? Who are the consumers? What do they want? How do we satisfy their <coughs> intense <coughs> something like that? Um, but mostly, I promise I won't say that word. Starting off with Barnaby. I'm mic'd up, so I'm good. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chris, for this great intro. I put the timer on so I'm not too late and I leave some time for my other street salesmen. Uh, my name is Barnabé. I'm a researcher at the Robust Incentives Group. It's a research team of the Ethereum Foundation doing mechanism design and crypto economics. I want to tell you a little bit today about uh, the supply network of Ethereum and sort of introduce the basic uh, principles upon which the design philosophy of our block space rests. So if I had to re summarize the, the design philosophy in a very concise sentence, I would say Ethereum is trying to achieve this low-powered validation and high-powered construction. So I'll expand on what I mean by this. Uh, and to do that, I'll kind of take you through the different layers of the Ethereum stack today. Uh, starting from the consensus layer, and then moving on to the fee market, which provisions the block space and the network resources, and then telling you a little bit about the market structures that evolved uh, from that. So meet our validators. They are the ones who are building the block space for you. They are the ones who are putting network resources uh, at your disposal. Uh, Ethereum runs a consensus mechanism known as Gasper. It's proof of stake since last year. This is the one year anniversary, so it's also a, an important date. Woo. Um, and some of the properties of Gasper is that we have a new block coming out uh, every 12 seconds. So one of the validators is sampled at random and tasked to make that block. Uh, we have a finality gadget, which checkpoints the chain and gives it economic weight, uh, something like every 32 blocks, so every 6.4 minutes in the happy path. It's slower than Cosmos, but it still does its work. Uh, and on top of this uh, finality gadget, we also have this property that we consider very important in Ethereum, which is dynamic availability, which means that even if we can't finalize something, we try to make progress by growing the chain. And this is unlike, uh, for instance, Tendermint. But as I understand it, it's a bit similar to what Polkadot uh, offers. So how do you become validator? If you have 32 ETH at your disposal, you can put them at stake. You send them to the deposit contract. You activate with that one validator, which has today a maximum of 32 ETH at stake, but tomorrow we are hoping to potentially increase uh, that number. And it's important to remember that the stakers aren't all node operators. So you have solo stakers who provide both the capital and also run the node. But you, of course, have uh, staking pools that may or may not offer things like liquid staking derivatives. So essentially, decoupling this role of operating the node and providing the capital for it. So that was a bit about how the blocks are made, like who are the people behind the, the scenes. Uh, let me tell you a bit more about the composition of these blocks. So in Ethereum, we measure the network use with something that is called gas, which measures how complex your transactions are and how much resources they require to, to use for their execution. And as of August 2021, we have this mechanism well known under the name of EIP-1559, which tries to target a certain supply of gas per unit of time. So we have blocks which have a gas limit of 30 million gas, but in reality, we target 15 million. And doing this targeting thing allows us to, at the protocol level, 
um, mandate that you pay a dynamic fee that evolves according to the demand. So if the demand is very high, you have to pay more. If the demand is low, you have to pay less. So we get this credible signal in protocol, and we mandate that you pay that uh, for your transaction. So this is kind of how we measure yeah, how much people want the resources that the network of Ethereum provides them. Of course, the Ethereum L1 is very clogged. This is why the gas prices are high when it's not a bear market. And so the plan for Ethereum is to scale with something that's called rollups. They are layer two solutions uh, where you bridge your assets to. Uh, but these chains, which are yeah, really chains, what they do is they settle on Ethereum. So they, Ethereum is sort of the ultimate backbone of the security of these chains. And so they inherit the security by posting their proofs and posting their data to the Ethereum layer one. Uh, and the rollups yeah, can be verified either optimistically, like optimistic rollups, or pessimistically with um, ZK proofs, SNARKs. All right, and so we have this supply of gas that the protocol gives us, but of course we all love big blocks. Uh, we want to have more out of our block space, we want to refine it, we want to offer more services. And so the recent trend in Ethereum is really to invoke high-powered entities that we now know as, as builders in the construction of the Ethereum blocks. And so to kind of understand how these builders came to the scene, it's useful to have a bit of historical context. And the historical context is that MEV always existed, but we kind of started understanding it around 2020, perhaps. Uh, it started wrecking every single one of our mechanisms one by one, and we're still kind of fighting against it. Uh, but what is really the nature of this, of this value? So MEV comes from the fact that validators control the state transition, and this control is very valuable, and the value that they can get from this control is what we call uh, MEV. But the validators, or even the miners before them, uh, figured out pretty quickly that yeah, taking advantage of that control is, is very difficult. And so they, they started sourcing the information of how to extract the MEV to, to other parties, which were known as, as the searchers. And with the move to proof of stake, well, they realized that this market structure was not really tenable. And so now we move to a system where most of the validators on our network aren't actually the ones who are building their blocks. They're asking a network of builders to build the blocks on their behalf. So you can really think of the builders are as more centralized entities that are just very good at packing stuff together. And, and when we realize, well, you know, there is this fundamental asymmetry between building a block and validating it. So yeah, building a block is a one-shot effort that somebody has to expand, but the whole network is responsible for its security, so the whole network should validate it, but that validation can be pretty light. Then we started thinking, well, what else can we get the builders to, to do for us? And so we have now a bunch of updates on the roadmap, such as uh, data availability sampling or validity proofs, that essentially might become roles that we ask the builders to do. And so we're really separating today in the Ethereum protocol the function of constructing the block and the function of, of validating it. And this market structure has some pretty deep implications that I hope we talk about during the, the panel too. And so, yeah, so the builders are the ones that connect this larger network of services that are now uh, living as infrastructure around the Ethereum protocol. It was, um, yeah, it's, a lot of people are, of course, observing this because it's, it's a very dense network and, and also poking fun at it because it's getting a little too complex. So my peer, uh, Sam, has made this uh, chart trying to depict the, the real Ethereum supply chain. But jokes on him, it's actually even more complicated than this. It looks more like this very hectic and dense uh, network of, of services uh, with the proposers on one side, which are the, the true protocol agents, and the users on the other side that are people like you who just want to transact uh, and not get extracted from when they do so. And this whole dense network of services that exists uh, between the users and the, and the protocol. So yeah, this is what Ethereum is today. There's a lot more to say about it, but I wanted to give you a, a bit of a picture uh, so that we can talk about that later. Thank you. And I'll pass the mic to my, yeah, Robert. Hey. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Rob from Polkadot, an uh, architect and uh, developer. Uh, talking a bit about block space and core time, so I, 
imagine many of you saw the earlier presentation about Agile core time. That's great because it's a lot of background for uh, how the scheduling and, and such in this system is going to work. Um, so what is Polkadot at the core? Well, it's, it's really two things. Uh, one, it's an efficient data availability system. Uh, and it's a consensus enshrined economic game for using validator CPU resources in a crypto economic game to validate commitments about those data blobs. So this blob was a block and that block was valid. Um, for those of you in the roll-up world, this might sound fairly familiar. We're using a CPU crypto economic game instead of uh, a ZK coprocessor, for instance. And you can build roll-up-like constructions on top of that, such as parachains. Um, so there are two key components that I've identified in the um, sort of very low level of block space. We have a bit of a, 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 diver a divergence on this panel, I'd say, where we're, we're very focused on like this, this deep in the stack stuff. Over time, we're going to get up to a lot of that builder, builder, proposer networks, and so on. Right now, we're very deep in the scalability and scheduling of things that use this data availability system and things that uh, execute using those blobs to prove commitments. Uh, we have a number of cores. So validators are each bringing a certain amount of CPU resources to the table and a certain amount of bandwidth to the table. Uh, each core essentially entitles a blob and a state transition to uh, an equal fraction of that bandwidth and CPU time uh, every relay chain block. So you know, we try to frame this something as a, uh, like a large CPU. It's a big decentralized CPU. Um, and that CPU has a number of cores. They execute WASM code, and there's this crypto economic game around it. Uh, they, each core processes one workload, so a blob and a piece of code and some commitments coming out of that code, uh, every six seconds. Now, I'll talk a bit about where, this, where cores are right now um, and some of the stuff for the future, uh, but parachains are the main thing that people talk about with Polkadot. Uh, they are a roll-up-like construct that uses cores for eager validation of blocks. Uh, they're not the only thing that you can do with cores. You can, in theory, do anything on a core. Uh, it just needs data and executes code, makes sure the output is correct. So we have uh, one megabyte per second of data availability bandwidth uh, and about 1,000 transactions per second, which is probably the worst metric ever, but we don't really have better ones. Um, <laughs> execution capacity with 12 to 18 second finality. So fast finality, write Rust code that compiles to WASM. Uh, we want to get as many cores as possible because that is our block space of Polkadot. We have scalability. Get as much block space out there as possible and then allocate that resource, that scalability resource, as efficiently as possible. If allocative efficiency of core time. So, we think about the, um, the block space demand distribution. Um, and block space is used by applications, which in turn have demand from users. But what the core layer sees is mostly application demand that has user demand sort of refracted through it. Uh, the block space demand distribution is probably something like a power law distribution. You have uh, some applications that need as much block space as they can get. And that's sort of the fat tail. These are things that are uh, going hyperbolic, have uh, incredible amounts of gravity that are attracting lots of users and transactions. Then you also have this long tail, the bootstrapping tail, uh, of applications which don't have that much underlying demand, don't need that much block space, and have uh, relatively few users, but they're bootstrapping, and there are many of them. Uh, and the small consumers of block space of today will be the large ones of tomorrow. That's sort of at least the uh, entrepreneurship principle. Um, we measure block space with core time. How much time on how many cores is a particular piece of code using? Uh, essentially, how often you get to submit workloads to core. The current approach right now is slot auctions, which is sort of you participate in an auction to get reserved access to a core for uh, one or two years. This addresses a very thin slice of that demand distribution, things that need exactly one core all the time. Uh, that's not that useful. So we're shifting our scheduling approach away from that to agile core time markets. So combine things sort of like cloud style. You have reserved, guaranteed at different frequencies. Say once every six seconds, once every 12 seconds, once every uh, minute, once every 10 minutes. And 
then you also have on-demand spot. So it's just like cloud. You reserve up front. There are markets for sort of reserving. And then there's markets for burst capacity. Uh, and then one of the other major features that we're planning is sort of elastic scaling. When you have a huge demand for block space on the application side, which is highly volatile, we want to make sure that that demand doesn't get capped out so Polkadot has a certain number of cores, and ideally, each application should be able to use whatever proportion of those cores that they need to serve their users. Um, so this is where elastic scaling comes in. If something needs, this is idealistic, but if something needs 50% of Polkadot's cores at any given time, it should be able to get them. That's at least the long-range goal of uh, the work that we're doing. Fairly short on time, but um, what if you need less than a core? This is sort of an emerging research direction. Uh, one, we want data and compute workloads to be maximally full. What we've seen is that most of the time, applications don't have 1,000 transactions or 3,000 transactions to ship off to Polkadot every six seconds. Uh, they can either have lower frequency blocks, or they could just share that block with others. So uh, this implies selling core time not to applications, but rather to these higher level builders as we move up the stack towards the types of things that uh, Barnaby and the others here have mentioned. Selling core time instead maybe to some abstraction over uh, collator groups or builders rather than the individual state machines uh, which can aggregate and make sure that those cores are used as efficiently as possible. Um, you can imagine the current parachains see, being seen as having sort of enshrined builders and this is just a different way of looking at that. That is probably all my time and a little more. Thank you for your uh, attention and I will pass off to Yannick. Hi everyone, my name is Yannick, um, and I'm working with Shutter Network, and I'm here because uh, Shutter, Shutter Network is not a, a chain or anything, but we're collaborating with Gnosis Chain, which is a chain, um, with the goal of making their blockchain a little bit, um, or their block space, um, uh, safer to use, and, uh, and maybe even a bit more fair to use. What's Gnosis Chain? Uh, Gnosis Chain provides um, Ethereum-like block space, so it's um, basically the same protocol. It uses the same software, the same clients. Um, um, it's just a different state. Uh, and consequently, um, it also shows uh, the same market structure. So um, um, you have the same uh, fee model and, and things like this. Are, it's basically all the same. Um, so it also benefits from all the um, developments that are done in the Ethereum space um, because of that. But unfortunately, um, there's also downsides in this uh, market. As in any market, there's um, actors which are, which are more powerful and some actors which, uh, uh, which are less powerful, and they uh, can be exploited in some cases. In particular, users, uh, they are probably in, in, a very, in the least powerful position. Um, and uh, they often get, if they trade, they often get sandwiched or front run. And that's basically what we're trying to uh, fix. Um, the more powerful actors here are um, block builders and um, block proposers because they are like um, in a yeah, position that's been chosen by the protocol to, to build blocks. Um, uh, yes, so why, what's the reason that uh, a user is in such a, um, a weak position? I think it's because they, um, when they buy block space, they also have to, um, uh, buying block space by sending a transaction, they also have to uh, send information um, to the public um, about what they're going to do with that block space. Um, and in information in market is very valuable in general. In particular, in, um, uh, in a blockchain, you can use that information to, to build that block accordingly. For example, you can put another transaction in front of that, um, that user's transactions. So the way we try to fix this is uh, to give the user privacy. So we try to allow the user to buy block space to send that transaction without um, saying what they're going to do with that space. And only when the transaction is, um, is to be executed on top of the um, pre-existing state, uh, only then uh, they get decrypted. Um, and by then it's too late for um, other actors to ex exploit this information or to monetize this information. Um, concretely, um, how do we do it? We have a um, threshold um, committee, so a set of nodes um, that collaborates uh, to produce um, keys. And users can use these keys to um, encrypt their transactions. They send, then send it to the protocol. The protocol commits to including them. And yeah, that's basically what I guess what, what I said earlier. Um, um, and only when, when it's already um, a time to execute the transaction, then they get uh, decrypted by this um, committee. So the committee broadcasts then the decryption keys. 
Um, in the implementation, uh, we try to do this, basically our, our, um, um, our approach there is to be as minimally invasive uh, as possible. So we try to not make a hard fork. We, um, this comes with some trade-offs, but the advantage is that it's um, uh, not a lot of commitment by the protocol to implement it, and uh, not the whole protocol has to agree on it, and it's um, generally much safer. Uh, the main component here is um, a special contract, the sequencer contract, and this contract allows users to um, post their transactions um, in, in, in sort of a, a first-in, first-out queue. And this contract charges a fee according to um, the current um, base fee of the protocol. So what's interesting here is that the, um, uh, this block space now is not sold by a proposer, but by the protocol itself um, via this contract according to the rules that are defined in this contract. Of course, adding it to the um, sequencer contract is not enough. They have to end up in blocks somehow, and for that, uh, we need proposers. Um, they opt in uh, into our, in, the, in this first version of the protocol to participating uh, by registered and uh, registering another contract. Then everyone knows um, who is participating and who isn't. And when they do that, they commit um, themselves to um, to fill um, any block they propose with um, transactions from that contract. The keeper set that's supposed to create the decryption keys, they see which uh, proposers participate in the protocol. So whenever um, the protocol selects one of these proposers to produce a block, um, they um, produce the, uh, the next keys that, that have to be used to, um, to build the block. Um, now, this is, um, as I said, it comes with a lot of, lots of trade-offs, and the biggest trade-off here is that the um, commitment by the, um, or the constraint uh, by the proposers is not, it's not enforced at all. So it's basically, it can only be enforced via the social layer. So for example, if a staking pool participates in the protocol, everyone would know uh, that, um, and if they don't follow, then we would know who they are, and we could like, maybe punish them socially. But ideally, we don't want to rely on these um, things, so in the future, oops, there they are. Um, so in the future, we hope that we, um, and we, we will be able to slash them so we can make a, a smart contract, um, use something like Eigenlayer to, um, um, yeah, to slash proposers that build blocks um, that don't include these encrypted transactions. Um, and at an even bigger step from there, we can make these blocks even invalid, and they would be rejected by the whole protocol and you know, all would be fine. Um, Next thing, uh, validated particip participation should be mandatory at some point uh, so that uh, users don't have to wait for, um, for the protocol to select a proposer uh, from that set, but then any block would fulfill these um, constraints ideally. And another thing we can do, we can, in the sequencer contract, we can um, build uh, more elaborate um, market rules. So, for example, at the moment, um, as I said, we uh, charge us the base fee at the current, uh, current uh, price. We don't pay anything to the proposer. We could add, um, pay something for the proposer, or we could implement some sort of auction in there, so that if there's uh, too many transactions, then um, the transactions that pay the most will get included. And another interesting thing we, uh, we could think of implementing there is um, changing the decryption conditions, um, or like allowing the users to decide on, on specific conditions when these transactions should be executed, for example, not just in the next block, but they could be uh, decrypted when, for example, a price moves too much in one direction, or you could do it timing-based, maybe for, uh, 10 days from now I want to execute my transactions. So these things um, are possible there as well. Yeah, I think that's all. So, over to you. <laughs> Great. Uh, can you all hear me? Excellent. Um, so, I am Sam Hart. I uh, work in the Cosmos ecosystem more broadly, although I'm starting to branch out a little bit. Um, I work at a, a company called Skip that does um, uh, MEV and kind of application-specific block space solutions, as well as order flow solutions in Cosmos. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the problems that we're facing, um, some of which I think are going to be relevant in the very near future for Ethereum rollups and, uh, and potentially other people on this panel. Um, and a little bit about kind of where I think we're going as well. 
Um, actually, before I get to this slide, I, I think just in, in service of the conversation that we're about to have, I'll just say a little bit about like Cosmos chains and blocks um, themselves. So uh, Cosmos is, is is not a chain. It is a uh, it is a kind of design pattern or or uh, heterogeneous architecture um, that basically uh, assumes that you have an application specific chain. Um, and some kind of networking protocol that can be uh, kind of uh, authenticated in a, you know, bidirectionally. Um, this means that the chains uh, are going to be quite unique, and um, this is kind of one of the, the main selling points, is that if you have a very uh, unique application, if you need to do things that are you know, quite low level and novel, Cosmos might be a, an interesting place to build because it doesn't really make a lot of assumptions about the application architecture itself. Um, this makes doing building MEV solutions quite interesting in Cosmos. Uh, one, one, because uh, if you want to do something radical with your block space, this might be why you would build a Cosmos application. But it also means that there's a lot of kind of there, there's a lot of heterogeneity, heterogeneity in the network, um, and there's a lot of kind of a cat herding that's necessary to create any kind of standardization across these different uh, applications. So um, in order to get a little bit of additional standardization, we built this product called the Block SDK. Um, it's one of two products that we have. We have a kind of an order flow solution, routing solution, and this Block SDK. I'm only going to be talking about this one today. And um, the idea is that. Uh, it gives a chain um, some, some kind of skeleton or structure by which um, developers can program their block space. So uh, it gives you this kind of generalized mempool, which you can sort and filter and, and manipulate transactions uh, into lanes. And then there's a, a kind of execution path that you can, um, you can play with for each of these lanes. Um, Again, if you're going to be building a Cosmos application, like one of the reasons that you might do that is because you, you want to just mess with consensus itself in some way or, or kind of have your application like married to the consensus protocol in, a, in a, um, some interesting fashion. So uh, we kind of build this utility that allows for the transaction supply chain to really be kind of like intimately linked with the consensus protocol. Um, so. Uh, concretely, what we're building here is a Cosmos SDK module, although we're kind of considering some uh, deploying this into other domains. And it leverages uh, Comet BFT's uh, ABCI++ features, the, the kind of latest and greatest there, which really give you kind of hooks into each sta stage of consensus. Um, just for uh, kind of the sake of everyone getting background here, uh, Comet BFT is, of course, a BFT consensus protocol. It has kind of interleaved um, stages of gossip and voting. Um, it's a two-stage consensus protocol. Um, and uh, this ABCI++ or application interface um, gives you these calls or hooks into various stages of consensus. Um, yeah, so basically ap application devs now have this, uh, this kind of uh, binning algorithm and a set of uh, successive computation steps that, that are available to them in their application if they use this SDK. Um, just to illustrate this a little bit more directly, um, so here you can see uh, each call, each stage of consensus, and each lane. So um, you may so you may want to kind of classify an oracle transaction and have that processed on, uh, in, a, in a specific way at each step. Um, you may want a, a bid if you're creating a, an auction. Um, so you can classify this bid, insert it into the kind of sub mempool, and then have that, um, that processed uh, at one or more steps. Um, similarly with just regular transactions. And, and really, this allows you to kind of build any kind of transaction classification system and 
do whatever you want. I mean, there's uh, it, sometimes it's a little challenging to to kind of describe what's what this thing affords you because it's it's really just a kind of blank canvas for creating very specific application. Um, important thing to keep in mind here is that, uh, and this is like a something that I have kind of trouble describing to people who are maybe mostly used to, used to using smart contracts is um, when you're breaking apart the stages of consensus like this, uh, the, the application that you're writing actually needs to deal with uh, different views by, by various actors. Uh, so the proposer is doing different work than all the other validators at a certain stage, and you can individually program these different roles at different stages. Um, so uh, the proposer is only able to, uh, to propose something with this specific block space structure or run this specific computation. And the validators maybe are uh, verifying uh, that execution or uh, potentially like adding other information um, or gossiping it you know, after they've seen uh, seen a tr transaction or a, an execution kind of uh, execution uh, termination. Um, so, last slide, uh, just a little bit of kind of like speculation here. Um, uh, in this kind of application specific model, really it forces you to, uh, the, the developer, to think about blockchains as having some degree of agency. And I think we're going to get to this in some of the conversation. Um, one example is uh, one chain buying another chain's Oracle services. Um, so how, the types of things that we're starting to think about at Skip is like, how do you price these things? Um, traditionally, you think about uh, a protocol kind of engaging in some kind of third-party provider uh, to, to purchase services. but. And, and those, the cost of those services is kind of amortized into some kind of aggregate contract. But um, the cost of those services also includes this, the cost of de, um, landing transactions on the chain. So maybe there's a way to actually uh, couple the service contract with um, some kind of dedicated block space um, so that um, you, can, you can actually like bake that into um, the, the offering. Um, yeah, and I, I guess just to contrast uh, nicely with, with Rob's uh, like metaphor or kind of primary metaphor that we're thinking about, um, where Polkadot's kind of like focused on this like CPU analogy, a lot of what, I, that what we've been thinking about is like uh, broadband networks. Um, so lanes are kind of like uh, uh, Frequencies in the frequency spectrum that, and there's a, a rich literature on various allocation mechanisms um, for, for instance, like mobile roaming, um, and that's like some of the the research that we're starting to draw on for peer-to-peer uh, -peer kind of allocation of bandwidth or or lane space. So, um, with that, I'll give it back to Chris. Thank you. Um, does this work? Test, test, yes. So just as a little bit of a recap, I think so far we've heard a lot about the supply side of block space. From Barnaby, uh, we heard about uh, the Ethereum, a sort of block space supply chain. Ethereum is definitely the OG producer of block space. I think we can credit it with the, the concept. Um, and also, I think Ethereum is the most you know, the, the most kind of mature ecosystem in terms of MEV kind of pushing these questions of commitments and fairness and allocation all the way up the supply chain so we can conceptualize the supply chain, you know, from user to pr block producer. There are a lot of steps in between, as Sam's diagram uh, elucidated. Um, from Rob, we heard about the kind of machinery of block space supply, I'd say, like the, the uh, internal mechanics which Polkadot uses to create these different cores, almost like a CPU producing lots of different uh, kinds of block space, um, or, or at least maybe not exactly kinds, but different 
uh, lane, I shouldn't use the word lanes, different, different cores, I'll just use your word, cores of block space um, that can be produced in parallel. Um, from Yannick, we heard about a kind of what I might even call a differentiated flavor of block space. There's shutterized block space and regular block space, right? So there's some block space product differentiation going on over on Gnosis chain. Mm -hmm. um, and from Sam, we heard about uh, a framework to kind of define lanes of block space, and I, as, a, as I understand it, uh, an interesting twist, which is a framework that in some sense gives the protocol a little bit more information about what the block space is being used for, that allows the protocol to see more of the demand side and discriminate in a certain sense between different kinds of demand, presumably or in order to provide some kind of better uh, gestalt guarantees to users, uh, like that Oracle updates are processed first. So, on this panel, I want to invert the question a little bit and see if it can help illuminate some similarities and differences between these approaches and uh, perhaps some choices and mechanics which might have implications for users. And I want to do that first by talking about the demand side. So to start us off, uh, for each person here on the panel, I have two questions, one short and one long. And the short question is, well, you know, we're all sitting here, we're designing these combinatorial and dimensional block space markets. You know, maybe we're SPF and we're doing it while playing League of Legends, maybe not. Um, but my question, short question for you is, what um, interesting block space products have you personally purchased or participated in the purchase of? And my long question for you is, what is your model of your block space consumer? In each of these cases where you're thinking about designing the supply side of block space, who is the consumer who you conceptualize that you're building this block space for, and what do they want? And how does that understanding inform your design? So maybe starting with Rob. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I have, uh, I've, I've helped participate in uh, parachain auction crowd loans. I think that's probably uh, a pretty exotic one, but probably not too surprising given that I'm coming from Polkadot land. Um, but it, it's an interesting question because uh, our mental model, a lot of it is of um, sort of demand propagating through a system with many layers. Um, ideally, all of the stuff that we're building, I think it's great. Ideally, a user should never have to think about any of that. Um, so the end user should be, uh, you know, they, they want a thing to happen. They want it to be a useful thing. They want it to be secure, not get reverted. They want to see the results ideally quickly. Um, but I'd say for the stuff we're talking about here today, our, uh, our user is potentially an application developer or potentially, maybe we can go two levels up in the stack between the, the user talking about opening things up to builders, the builders who want to create, they want to buy block space and they want to fill up workloads for cores with um, things that are, are uh, going to pay them more than they paid for the block, uh, the block space. Um, and then applications that are making, maybe making deals with those uh, builders. And I'd say those are the levels that we're thinking about from that vantage point. Obviously, we want to see sort of through the fog of war all the way to the users, uh, but I'll leave off there. Thank you. Sam. Uh, so an interesting purchase of block space. Uh, in, I think, 2018, I made a transaction on Bitcoin to kind of memorialize a, an artist essay that a friend of mine wrote. Um, so interesting time stamping use. Um, and then in terms of the uh, kind of our model of the user, uh, I think I mentioned in, in the talk, um, one of the things that we are thinking pretty deeply about is chains as uh, purchasers of block space. And um, there's a lot of kind of interesting limitations that you run up run into there. Um, first of all, uh, there, there's an identification problem of like, who is the chain? What is the chain? Um, how do you kind of distinguish one from another? Uh, and then the, uh, the system by which you kind of come to agreement uh, that one chain is going to buy another chain's block space is uh, just pretty uncharted territory. Um, so there's uh, kind of pricing and allocation mechanism on, or kind of problems on, on both ends there. But that's been a very fun kind of investigation. Thanks, Yannick? Yeah, for me, the right side of the meme definitely fits. I don't use blockchains too much. Um, 
I think I bought an NFT once. I have an ENS name, but not much more than that. Um, and whenever I did that, I didn't really care too much about which block space I get, as long as I get included somehow. Uh, could have been like, doesn't, I wouldn't even mind, mind it waiting for, for very long, but I couldn't really express this, I guess, uh, to, to the blockchain. About users that we have in mind, um, um, I guess we think it's a normal user. They definitely don't want to care about any of this. Um, they want to, have, uh, like, want to make their life very, very easy. Um, we typically think of traders, so they want to uh, buy something on an exchange. Um, uh, token A for token B, they don't necessarily even care about the price too much, as long as they know that they're not, uh, and they don't get a, an unfair price or a price biased against them. Um, yeah, basically, that's like a guy who wants to buy something. <laughs> Thanks, and Barnaby. Um, yeah, so as a user of Blockspace, I would say on Ethereum, the transaction that's probably the most meaningful to me is buying my own ENS. I think that was one of the first things I did, and yeah, it felt meaningful in a way that, oh, I have my own spot on this network, and that's pretty cool. Um, I enjoyed using Blockspace to play Dark Forest on Gnosis Chain, formerly XDAI, uh, something you could never do on the Ethereum L1, so it also kind of opened my eyes to, oh, there's like these other use cases that you, you might want to, to look at. Um, and then in terms of the, the model of a user that we have, um, in Ethereum, sometimes it does feel like we are building things in protocol for the users that we had two years ago because it's so slow to get things into the protocol. So when we were developing EIP-1559, it was really this idea that, oh, you know, uh, oracles suck. It's very difficult for users to get their transaction on chain. Uh, but nowadays, many users won't see the chain. They'll just use account abstraction, or they'll be on rollups, or they'll be something else. And so now, the real, I would say, power users that we have on, on Ethereum, they're really the rollups that are buying uh, the block space, and now, the, or in the future, the, the blob space. And so, yeah, it, it does feel like for Ethereum specifically, we are, we are more reactive and proactive in terms of serving some kind of user demand, which is both yeah, a blessing because it means we don't have to anticipate very heavily on things. We just look at what's going on and we try to design for it. But also, yeah, it means that sometimes we're a bit late to ship what we should have on chain. Thanks. Um, let's move on because we've talked a little bit about something that looks like a market. Um, I have a confession, which is that I never actually went to an Econ 101 class, but I hear that in Econ 101 classes, they show a chart which looks like this. You know, also in the second confession, I just found this on Google Images, but I think it's from an economics textbook. Um, and this chart talks about supply, demand, and a clearing price um, that allows supply and demand to meet. Uh, and my question for you now is, how do you think about block space as a product? And I want to start on the opposite side with Barnaby. And in particular, the frame for my question is, as a product, it seems like Blockspace has some properties which are kind of like a commodity. Like sometimes as a user, you just want to get your transaction in to buy your ENS name. Like you're not super, you know, you don't have super specific preferences. But sometimes it has properties which also make it look like a, a kind of specialized or differentiated good. Like maybe you want a shutterized kind of block space instead of a regular kind of block space. Maybe you want a particular lane in block space. Maybe you want a guaranteed core of block space, right? These are, you know, something we could understand as a dimension. So my question for you is, to Ethereum, is block space something that has dimensions or is it dimensionless? And do you think that the MEV supply chain will force you? You know, in a sort of from the reactive standpoint, do you think? Uh, now I'm asking you to predict, right? right. Sorry, but <laughs> do you think that uh, treating block space as dimensionless quality uh, quantity, even if Ethereum wants to do that, is sustainable, and why? Right. Yeah. I guess the question is also for whom is it dimensionless? So definitely for the users, we want block space to not even exist, like to just be an abstraction. And a lot of the ways that users interact with the block space is just mediated from their wallet UX. The wallet UX can do things depending on how the block space is provided in the first place. So it's a very different experience clicking accept on MetaMask when you are doing something on L1 versus something on Optimism. Like you get this instant feedback, which yeah, just gives you a very different experience. I would expect it to be the same uh, if I was using Shutterized when it launches. Like the wallet would. I don't know, maybe be darker and show that, OK, I'm doing something that is not revealed to the rest of the network for some time. So yeah, a lot of that dimensionless, I think, maybe 
appears like that. But then, of course, you build your block space as a protocol, and especially as a protocol like Ethereum that does try to cater more and more to things like rollups, where most of the action is going on, as something that maybe has dimensions or something that can be more refined. So yeah, the whole purpose of the supply chain is to say, yeah, sometimes users don't just want to send you their transaction directly and get included. Like There has to be many steps in between. And that means your block space isn't uh, completely fungible from one state access to, to the next. Um, yeah, The question from the L1 perspective is, do we need to care about this if everybody goes to rollups? I feel like we do because the things we do on L1 also map to what happens on L2s, especially the ones that are EVM equivalent and reuse like a lot of the same infrastructure. Uh, so yeah, it was a long-winded answer, but I would say dimension full block space is, makes sense to me. Dimension full, but kind of waiting to see what the dimensions turn out to be, something like this? Hopefully not predetermining that too early. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Fair, fair. All right, well, we've got one specific proposal for a dimension with shutterized block space. So do you want to talk a little bit about maybe how you think about the relationship between these two dimensions, both from the perspective of Gnosis Chain or your kind of protocol design and from the perspective of the user? Like, you know, as a user, am I clicking a button that says, such, says shutterized? Am I exp expressing some kind of like, I want fairness sort of preference? You know, how do, how do users think about this? And how even do these, do, do these two dimensions of blo block space interact? You know, what if my transaction is going to go through and it looks good, but someone else has a shutterized transaction that I didn't know about, now it comes in first, you know, could this cause confusion or kind of effects that aren't clear until you actually see these markets in action? Yeah, so, um, ooh, lots of questions. Um, I don't think uh, I would want the user to, to know if they're using the shutterized block space or not. Um, it would be nice from a marketing perspective, I guess, because uh, then our name would show up in the wallet. But uh, for the user, I don't think that's, uh, that's very appealing. I think that should be a decision uh, that the um, dApp or the, um, the application that you use makes for you. Uh, because um, not for every transaction it's actually need needed. Um, but for some it is, and the user like doesn't usually probably doesn't have the technical knowledge, or at least we don't want to require them to have the technical technical uh, technical knowledge to to make this uh, decision. Especially because it can also be like somewhat risky if they make uh, make the wrong decision. They either pay a little bit more in transaction fees, or they um, uh, they lose or, uh, lose because they get front run. Um, yes, um, uh, from a protocol perspective, I see this nice chart where the two two graphs meet. Um, I guess um, in our case it's a little bit different because um, they, um, we don't really need this, so we, we don't have, need to have a price dif differentiator there. We basically just have a fixed uh, maximum limit of uh, block space that is um, uh, kind of earmarked for uh, shutterized transactions. And if that demand is not met, if there's not, uh, not enough transactions for that, then um, uh, this, this space can simply be used by, by other uh, transactions, by normal transactions. So kind of we, we get this um, equilibrium during a different mechanism. Um, yeah. yeah, it makes sense. Um, then Sam, I guess, on the, you know, Cosmos has a pretty complex, heterogeneous supply-demand hypergraph that I won't even try to render in an image. But in working on the block SDK, how do you think about this intersection? You know, you talked a little bit about maybe two sources of demand. You've talked about chains. You've talked about users. Um, then it seems to me like some of these some of these sources of demand also want to provide guarantees to other users, right? Presumably, chains are using the block SDK because by discriminating, by seeing more and picking what uh, demand they let in, what demand they give supply to, they can provide some more kinds of guarantees. So my question for you is, how do you? And I realize this is like large and amorphous, but how do you understand the interactions? of these parties who want different kinds of differentiated or discriminated block space? Are they cooperative? Are they adversarial? Uh, which of them are kind of compatible with each other? Um, and how you know, do you expect this to be something that like each app chain says, oh, OK, I'll have lane 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and they do x, y, z, a, b? Or do you expect this to be something more like dynamic contracting and why? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I guess I kind of make an assumption that there will be a, a range of actors here that are going to want to participate in a market um, of a, a kind of differentiated set of market structures. Um, a lot of this is still theoretical um, because we're assuming that there's going to be like much tighter integration between chains and like the 
the transaction supply chain is going to, to mature quite a bit. Um, but I, I guess I kind of think about block space, to your point earlier, it's almost like paper or something. You know, if, uh, if, if a blockchain is a publishing medium, then you know, block spaces are paper. And if you just want to buy kind of commodity paper, that is like good for a lot of different things. But you know, contrast this with like uh, publishing in the New York Times. You know, it's like a serialized format. It matters what day you're publishing on. It matters if you're at A1 on you know the, the New York Times homepage. Um, but you know, if you're signing a lease uh, agreement, you know, it's a it's a piece of paper, but it's like a very specific piece of paper that actually uh, kind of gives you access to um, you know, a title. So block space is a very kind of broad term, and then you, know, you, you can kind of narrow in to very specific dimensions, like how it's used and who are the parties engaged uh, that are using that block space. So to your uh, to kind of your question earlier of like, how do we think about the parties that are engaged in this block space. Um, well, I, I definitely think that this kind of commitment uh, uh, mental model is, is kind of core to our thinking. Um, there are um, parties who may trust one another completely, in which case they can kind of freely use one another's block space or, or kind of collaborate on transaction construction. And there may be parties who are completely untrusting and, and need some kind of arbiter or uh, custodian um, that they both trust. So kind of all of those options are, are kind of valid in my perspective. Makes sense. So you uh, hinted a little bit at the possibility of contention. You know, only one person can be on the front page of the New York Times, right? Uh, and this leads into my question to you, Rob, which is that you talked a lot about what I understand is kind of like low-level scheduler design. And I think one of your bullet points hinted at this uh, challenge of atomic composability. But I want to dig into that a little bit because, you know, with what little I know about operating systems, the hard thing to do, deal with is locks or shared memory or cases where you want to be doing, you know, many different kinds of programs, want to access the same state resource, and you want to preserve some kind of, you know, guarantees and even things like fairness um, uh, amongst the interactions of these programs. Now, this becomes three orders of magnitude more difficult in the distributed permissionless setting where any user can submit any transaction to your system and you don't need to deal with an ecosystem of programs you know, on one machine, one operating system that were presumably all ran by the same user, but a ecosystem of programs which might be in part run by users who dislike each other or are trying to outplay each other in some kind of economic game. So how do you think about this problem of contention in scheduling? Yeah, that's, that's a really good one. Um, before that, I, I want to talk a little bit about how we think about block space as a product, because I think that's significant here. Um, I've made the argument before in a, in a post that block space is not a commodity, but a class of commodities, and that these commodities are differentiated a, on a, a few different dimensions. So, so one of those is, is quality, um, essentially economic security. Uh, to use the paper metaphor, low, imagine if low-quality paper uh, had the ability to spontaneously burst into flame and take down other paper with it. Uh, I think that's a fairly accurate extension of the metaphor. Uh, general availability, so you know, it doesn't matter if there's a lot of paper, if it's all just sitting in a warehouse somewhere, it needs to be in the hands of people who need it. There has to be a lot of it. Uh, and flexibility, sort of the ability for different kinds of pens to write on that paper uh, in different colors, in different orientations. Um, and then I'd add, uh, circling back to the question, uh, sort of potential for composability, how possible is it for things to compose and actual composability, uh, which is one of the things that actually makes this graph kind of wrong. It makes block space behave a little bit more like a Veblen good. People want to use the block space that is where the action's happening. Um, this is important and affects those supply demand curves, so that's what I would call actual composability. Um, so when it comes down to uh, the, the atomic uh, concept, it, it probably does involve something like, and, and to be clear, this is an early research direction, so it's not something we have all the answers on just yet, uh, but 
the idea goes to having shared builders, so, or sort of shared builder sets that are running maybe a consensus protocol behind the hood, something like the shared sequencer is Hotshot, I don't know, um, in, in the Ethereum rollup uh, world, um, and having them create workloads that then uh, combine many different things in an atomic way. Now, that can introduce a dependency on the ability of a state machine to advance if that shared sequencer set decides to, say, censor them. Um, I, it, it seems quite attainable to allow um, state machines to rotate between different sequencers and even have, or different builders, and even have them uh, sort of, if they are being censored, have new ones pop up that then take on those rights. That seems like an encodable problem is generally how we would try to thread that needle between atomic composability, which really needs to be done at the building stage, uh, as well as censorship resistance and security and resilience. Cool, cool. So, um, I want to ask a little bit of an interlude question here. In we've heard a lot of what I would what I would almost call convergence of these architectures. You know, we've got commitments, we've got uh, structures that look. You know, you squint at them hard enough, they look like rollups. Of course, there are differences between them. Um, and what I want to ask you about now is, well, um, you know, block space. We're talking here about different systems, right? Polkadot, Cosmos, Ethereum, Gnosis, uh, and those systems have different assets, right? And they also, right now, have slightly different protocols and slightly different conceptions of how to produce block space. Uh, my question is, if you kind of fast forward time a little bit, you finish the current projects that you're working on, do you think that there's still some you know, differentiation between these things? Will they converge? Will there be some, ki some kind of homegrown, organic, cruelty-free, you know, artisanal block space? Is that just where the state lives, where the applications want to go? You know, to your point, Rob, and this time I'll start with you, going in the reverse direction. Um, do you think organic, cruelty-free block space can be produced uh, as a differentiated good, uh, you know, apart from just the asset? And what does it look like? There's this interesting feedback loop here where I would say uh, you can create organic, cruelty-free artisanal block space, but not homegrown, uh, per se. That it actually has to be done on industrial scales. Um, okay, tell me more. It, well, I, I think that there are, there are simply the network effects here of the amounts of economic security behind something in proof of work, uh, the amount of miners behind something in proof of stake. This is what I boil down to quality. So it's, it's almost definitionally impossible to be homegrown um, at least down to the core consensus guarantees. However, I think uh, organic cruelty-free is probably attainable, <laughs> uh, although, yeah, it, it does maybe introduce some, some market frictions. I don't think we have good definitions of what those terms mean in the block space world. Um, but I think about block space as like a, a raw material, uh, you know, something like steel. There are different industrial stale, scale steel manufacturing that is then further refined into other goods like I-beams. You don't want the I-beams in this building, for instance, uh, to fall down. Um, and that's sort of, you know, if there's a, a, a block space supermarket, I think that at this layer of the stack, we're talking about high quality steel and then the steel refineries. Right, I like the metaphor and I'm gonna take it. So, Sam, if Polkadot is the US steel of block space production, <laughs> then Cosmos is the like chaotic, you know, African bazaar. So tell me about block space production as you see it and the kind of quality of block space in Cosmos. What does that look like? How do users understand it and how do chains and developers understand it? Yeah, I, I guess I'm kind of forced to take the opposing homegrown uh, <laughs> commodity here. Um, I, so IBC, the, the Cosmos network, actually doesn't as assume that you're even running a blockchain. Um, you could just be running a, a single machine, which you call solo machine. And that uh, we've abstracted over that. So um, maybe there is a, a reason for uh, a single trusted entity to be publishing via a shared um, messaging protocol. Um, and potentially that's that's worthwhile. So um, if, you know, if that single provider uh, is a bank or a, um, a custodian or, uh, I, I don't know, just a, an artist who is publishing, you know, through this communication channel, 
um, maybe it actually is meaningful that uh, there's only a single kind of single signer on the other side. Um, I, I, so I, I think part of the, the kind of Cosmos thesis is that there will be box-based differentiation, and that is, uh, it's, it's really what the network is optimizing for. So, um, and, you know, we can hook into Polkadot for the, the kind of steel production, but, you know, you may also need, like, paint and, uh, and I don't know, just various other uh, commodities that you, you want to optimize, uh, you know, for, for cost and other qualities that, um, uh, in order to, to obtain these resources. So to kind of like uh, compose those together and, and create an application experience, um, you, you can actually draw from a, a wider array of like differentiated sources. Okay, okay. I'm gonna switch the order a little bit here and go straight to Barnaby. So continuing the metaphor, you may or may not like. <laughs> Scratching. Um, if Polkadot is US Steel, Cosmos is the bazaar, Ethereum to me is like the United Nations of block space. It's slow, it's procedural, but you know, all of the countries still send their delegates there, they at least pay fealty, all the roll-ups still at least claim to post some proofs to Ethereum once in a while. Um, and my question is, uh, is that, uh, is that kind of what you see as the long-term goal of the roll-up-centric roadmap? Is that, you know, what, what, what does Ethereum block space seek to become in this marketplace? Right. So if we're thinking of the Ethereum block space in a roll-up-centric map, uh, the question is, should we include the roll-up block space in Ethereum mm -hmm. block space? What do you think? What do I think? Yeah. Should we include the roll-up block, roll block space? Is roll-up block space Ethereum block space? Right, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it seems to me like there are many roll-ups and they, they're quite heterogeneous. They want to do different things. Yeah. Um, and can Ethereum block space, you know, my question back is can Ethereum block space support all those different things without compromising principles Ethereum cares about in order to be this United Nations of block space? Uh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, there's been like probably a bit of, um, not exactly concerned, but more thought given into, OK, who are the people that we're letting inside the coop? Like, um, there was a talk by Trent earlier on, on protecting the commons of, of Ethereum and what kind of like, uh, values or, or boundaries we can defend and establish in a way that's also productive and not just, oh, we are enclosing this thing and, and it becomes horribly extractive. So, so we do want this expansion and we do want this um, other thing, but, but it's true that um, having things like rollups, which are using our block space perhaps for different purposes than we expect to be, uh, but even things as I hinted in my talk, like builders. Um, so I would say, yeah, the, what Ethereum considers to be organic block space construction is, is something that the protocol has control over. So today, Builders are making the blocks with, with PBS, with MEVBOOST. So, so the organic version of that would be, well, we need that to enshrine that in the protocol, and we need to enshrine more communication or, and more things with the, with the rollups, for instance. So yeah, I would say probably the Ethereum goal is to be that, to, to, to retain that allure of, of this posture of, uh, of credible neutrality, so, so that yeah, the block space remains uh, valuable at the, at the L1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Yannick, uh, Gnosis, you know, uh, strikes me as kind of like the little Ethereum brother that moves quickly, right? And this allows you to offer uh, differentiated block space products, right? Like, like uh, Shutter block space. My question for you is, how do you see the future of block space production by Gnosis? Do you want, you know, do you want to differentiate yourself by offering these, like, different kinds of things, like Shutter Network, maybe change the configuration somewhat? Do you want to kind of have these things merged back and attract applications? How do you understand that market structure? So I'm, I can't really speak for Gnosis because I'm fair, uh, working fair, Shutter. Fair. But my understanding is that's uh, basically correct, the little brother, brother analogy. I think they, they would like that. Um, and they would also like to experiment a little bit, but still stay very close to, um, to Ethereum. Um, and I think the reason is simply that um, Ethereum can only provide so much block space. Uh, there's a, like a limit to that. Um, and of course, that block space is very valuable because it's very secure. Um, and having alternatives to that that looks very similar, but is maybe um, a little bit less secure or, um, um, or more um, 
um, or just bigger uh, in, in size. Maybe in the paper analogy, um, a paper that's maybe um, a little bit uh, less uh, thick, le less, less dense, and, um, but would still be valuable because they will always be users for, 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 uh, for block space. So, yeah, I think that's... Right, okay, okay. So, you know, the, 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 by the United Nations, there's like a, a stand, right, that produces some, some block space that's there, and it's the same kind. You can just grab it, <laughs> and the stand can change itself quickly. You know, the United Nations is slow. So yeah. This is the, yeah, makes sense. Um, right, okay. So now it's time for, for a little bit of popcorn. Uh, I think we've, we've, everyone, you know, stands risk of falling asleep as we dive into these details. Um, so we've built, of course, uh, these kinds of block space markets on a stack of turtle commitments. Right? It's commitments all the way down. We start with proposer commitments, maybe. We have you know, something like implicit proposer commitments with ABCI++. We have, as I understand, Rob, your reasoning about kind of uh, the commitment that all of these um, IT sort of providers are making when they're running Polkadot. Um, and as I understand, there's a contract which allows validators on Gnosis to make commitments to run the shuttle, shutter protocol and kind of respect what it says they should do. Not yet enforced, but could be. And my question for you guys is, are we building a sort of stack of turtles, a stack of Jenga blocks, and we pull one thing out and the whole tower will come crashing down? Or is it secure? Do you see, you know, what do you think would break? If you had to name one thing that you think in this tower of commitments and block space production markets will break in the next five years, what, it is, what is it and why? Starting with Barnaby. Uh, all right. So, yeah, I think you're making reference to uh, something I've talked about quite a bit in the recent past, the proposer commitments, so protocol enforced. So commitments is a bit of like an abstract word, but I think another way to think about it is as like services. Uh, what I was trying to explain earlier with the physics of Ethereum is you want low-powered validators to be able to, to run the network and to, and to secure it. Uh, and so these low-powered validators shouldn't, they, should, they are not the ones who are going to offer you services, right? Services, you can offer them if you have a model of your demand, if you're sophisticated enough to, to understand, okay, how do I refine my block space to offer the best version possible to, to my users? And so, yeah, really where Ethereum is going today is to say, well, the proposer shouldn't do any of that, and, and the proposer should just listen to builders who are offering these services or, or these commitments. Uh, and inspired by some of the work that Sam has done and, and seeing a bit what's happening outside of Ethereum, I, I try to push a little back on, on that narrative and to say, well, perhaps the proposer as the storefront of the protocol is really the only one that can offer these, these services um, properly. So, yeah, it does feel like we're in this tower of turtles when, when I think about the, the consequences and ramifications of that. For instance, I could ask my uh, validators, or the ones that I control, to only make valid blocks that give me a lot of money, and then I would probably never propose blocks, but it would be a very bad services to offer. So, yeah, we, the, the kind of design space here is, is, is wide open. I don't know what exactly would be like the first turtle to, to fall, but probably the complexification of this supply chain or, or supply network makes it that it becomes trickier and trickier to tell the user exactly what's going to happen to, to their transaction. And so I do think that the more complexity we build in our systems, either in protocol or out of protocol, like the more we expose ourselves to a yeah, crisis of legitimacy due to the fact that our system just isn't understandable any longer. So maybe the whole tower falls because of that. Yeah. Okay, okay, so, you know, uh, collapse of complex block space supply chains, something collapse like of complex yeah. societies, something like this. All right, Rob, um, you've chosen, it sounds to me, to build Polkadot on top of this industrial base of, like, well-understood scheduling for block space production. Um, and I'd kind of, I'd like to understand from you, you know, when you think about, I know you kind of see maybe one or two levels into the supply chain, maybe not the whole way, but when you think about this stack, why did you choose to build on that base? What do you see, you know, you chose to prioritize this, right? Uh, is that because you think it's, you know, a base that you need in order for the whole tower to remain steady? What's the rationale there? And what do you see, you know, in the less industrialized block space production? Do you see things breaking and why? Yeah, there's, there's this inherent difficulty with blockchain systems. We start with... Um, Byzantine fault-tolerant consensus secured by real economic value um, to create systems that have measurable costs of attack. Um, 
once you've got there, it only gets worse with every layer of complexity. Like that is the best it's ever gonna be. Um, every single protocol, uh, every level of complexity, every uh, sort of sub-refinery of, of goods, you know, turning steel into I-beams, they're all opportunities for things to go wrong. Um, I'd say this is the number one pitch for shared security because uh, it not only um, can lead to economies of scale, um, but it also implies that there are fewer opportunities for stuff to go bad. Um, now, that said, I think that in, in this model, in this research direction that we're exploring where block space is sold to builders who then bundle up things from applications, we are looking at potentially having things like uh, similar to Pepsi. I think that that's, that's necessary for the, um, the guarantees of continuity in block space and long-term allocation of block space to propagate all the way down to the allocation, application and user layers. Um, where I think things are most likely to go wrong is, uh, honestly, it's the inherent difficulty of gas metering. Um, gas is hard to price. You have some instructions which use one gas that take, well, you know, it even depends on the type of work you're doing. You read something from one memory location, it takes 20 times longer than reading it from another memory location. They cost the same amount of gas. I think this is the most tenuous bit in blockchains. I think it's an unsolved problem. Uh, but the more sort of like gas metering heavy work that needs to happen, uh, the more likely I think that we see liveness failures in deeper parts of the builder stack. Okay, uh, interesting. I, I think gas actually should bring us back to Shutter. So how do you think about, in this world where you don't actually know what the transactions contain until you've decrypted them, right, but the proposer is making a commitment to run them, how do you think about gas? Um, yeah, very simple solution. Uh, basically, the trans and we don't encrypt everything. So the, every transaction is annotated with um, a, a gas limit, a public gas limit. Uh, so the protocol, and you have to pay for the whole gas limit, so you don't get a refund if you don't uh, use all of that. Uh, that means essentially that you have to pay a little bit more, uh, potentially, depending on um, uh, on the transaction path uh, or the path, uh, the execution path your transaction takes. Uh, but it's from a protocol perspective, very simple and uh, very safe. Doesn't that leak information though? Is someone can't I see? Oh, your transaction needs 153,000 gas. That's a Uniswap swap. It does. I don't think in practice um, it, it's enough to, uh, to exploit that information. For example, uh, you will never be able to see if, um, if you buy or sell something, and if you front run, that's vital information if you buy or sell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And do you worry at all about like gas DOS? Like what if I see you've submitted a transaction with a certain gas limit, I can guess what it does, and then I try and change some other kind of state to make your transaction fail? Oh, interesting. Uh, I've never thought of that, but it seems very difficult to do because uh, you don't know what my transaction does, right? So uh, how would you um, influence, um, influence that? Like, I don't really uh, see how it works. But uh, yeah, I guess in, in theory, this, uh, things like that are possible. I mean, there's this awkward tension, right? Because as a user, you don't really want to pay for more allocation, more gas than necessary, uh, but some kind of adversary could cleverly exploit this and yeah. cause you to waste your money. So yeah, Sam. If there is a complex tower of commitments in the Ethereum MEV supply chain and a tower to come on top of the industrial foundation of the Polkadot supply chain, in Cosmos there are five million towers and they all intersect at you know, <laughs> unclear points in unclear ways and there's not even a single yes. protocol anymore and IBC has like 20 versions. So how do you think about wrangling this complexity? You know, what does, does Cosmos aim to standardize it, to contain it? Does Cosmos aim to, to, to localize disruption? How do you understand that? especially in your kind of work as Skip, in some yeah. way acting as a, not an intermediary to the transactions, but acting as this kind of neutral party. You don't have a blockchain, right, yet. How do you think about this? Well, as the designer of IBC, the kind of primary goal was fault isolation. Um, so that is, uh, is at least encoded in um, the kind of validity conditions that are passed between different chains, but there's lots of different ways that chain can fail, and there can be uh, uh, kind of leakage in that supply chain, particularly of, I mean, MEV is kind of the study of this leakage. Um, and I, I guess just to like draw out your analogy of 
Cosmos being a bazaar here, like it is actually possible to um, create a, a chain of that looks very much like the Ethereum supply chain, where the builder is its own chain and the searchers are their own chain, and like you, and Shutter Network is its own chain. So you can actually link these things and then pass transactions down. It's totally possible, um, and. I guess the, the way that we think about it is um, independent actors in this network should be able to fail. Um, that any actor in the system should actually be able to fail, uh, and the system as a whole should continue to advance. Um, and actors that become kind of important in the network should be held accountable. Um, and because there is this kind of like mesh of interactions between uh, different, different chains and different users, um, that accountability mechanism becomes really essential. So um, one of the ways that I think about um, the kind of enforcement of, of commitments is, is through this. It, there, it, commitments are, actually aren't one way. They're, they're actually consensual relationships between the actors. And you really need to think about the entire, like, uh, that entire process of, of engaging in a consensual process. Or, so what are the alternatives that each of these actors have? How replaceable are these actors? Um, and you know, what resources and guarantees are they providing one another? And, uh, and when you're kind of making a commitment, you know, who are the entities that are uh, that are actually observing and enforcing that commitment. Um, so uh, with that kind of global view, I, I think you want to kind of design for market structures that, um, that ensure that the, the actors that are uh, kind of impacted by the system are getting, the, uh, getting enough credibility from these commitments and, and um, a kind of sufficient level of trust from these commitments to, to actually engage in the system. Cool. So we only have a few minutes left here, and I want to move to a kind of production. So imagine that we have this panel again in you know a year or two, uh, maybe three, depending on how long people take to write Rust code. And that world is a world of fully programmable block space. So at least whatever you're currently envisioning, you know, your current understanding of what you need to build in order to make block space as industrial, as diverse and customizable, as foundational and robust, as you know, uh, specific and tailored to users' needs, like Shutter, um, as you think you should, what does that world look like? When are, when are we done, basically? And what does it look like when we're there? Starting with Rob. And keep these one minute. Yeah, we'll be quick. Um, so at least at the base layer, you know, I, I spoke in my talk a little bit about the uh, block space demand distribution. This, I think addressing this entire distribution and recognizing that it, it is rapidly changing and volatile is a key goal. Um, I think that it's going to take a few years to get there. But the ideal should be that building an application on top of these kinds of block space should feel like writing cloud software does now. Um, and then as a user, you shouldn't really need to think about what's happening. I think that's probably about a minute. OK, so AWS, block space AWS, click, Yes, click. but not, uh, not, evil. not controlled by right, a right, single right, right. Uh, bald man. Not, not, yeah, <laughs> not, not Jeff Bezos. OK, um, Sam? I mean, I, I guess to, just to be real about this, like we've talked about block space this entire time. Like, what we actually need is users, you know. Um, <laughs> so, Apply site economics. <laughs> so like, we, we, we just need to be like incredibly focused on creating product that people can use and having it meet their needs, um, and we're just nowhere near that that goal right now. Um, so, I, I mean, I'd love nerding about it, nerding out about like different designs. Um, I, I hope that some of these design directions like actually produce like you know real value for for users. Yeah, to keep it very short, I, I agree. I think a user shouldn't have to worry about this. And blockchains are complicated enough. User experience is, I think, still the biggest blocker of uh, crypto adoption. So I hope we can keep all this discussion away from the user. All right, Barnaby? Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to, to what Sam said. I, I, I really think we are trying to build for 
a diversity of use cases and a diversity of preferences. And if we had this fully programmable block space, we probably wouldn't need the panel in three years because, yeah, you would just, um, you could build anything you wanted with it. So, yeah, hopefully we get there. Well, thank you to all of the panelists. Blockspace Bazaar coming back to Protocol Berg, you know, 2026. Maybe we'll be done. We can just look at the slide. I hope Berlin doesn't look like this, actually, but you know, <laughs> um, aesthetics. It's the uh, Amazon Tower on the right. Yeah. <laughs> if you would like some block space, just find these folks afterward. They'll sell you some contracts, make some commitments, um, and it will be all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris.